Hello, my name is Ted Verani. I'm head of business development for WAP here. Welcome to uh, the Mobile Gaming Today panel. Let's start with something just incredibly obvious. So it's a big business, right? So maybe that's why you're here. We kind of want to get some more insights. And it's, uh, you know, last year, I think uh, News Zoo said it was, you know, pick a favorite analyst, but, you know, $50 billion a year business. Um, it's half of video game revenue. Um, crazy is even actually more than movies out there, too. And, and it's not done growing, right? It's going to, you know, we're projecting probably $70 billion by 2021. So massive business, massive opportunities, but you know, how do you stand out from the crowd? Right? That's the topic of today's conversation initially. So it's a very, you know, not only is a big business, of course, challenging, very crowded you know, marketplace. So we want to stand out from the crowd. But once you've acquired a customer, how do you, how do you retain you know, that customer? And, and after that, how do, you, how do you monetize them? How do you get more revenue from that to justify continued investment, new content, you know, indeed you know, marketing acquisitions for more players to keep your game alive? So, we're lucky to have a panel of experts here to answer those questions. Um, maybe just quickly about myself. Um, I work for WAP here. Um, those things, how to engage in retention, monetization, are very important to us. We're not a game maker. Uh, instead, we try to help uh, game makers uh, make more money outside of core gameplay, uh, specifically offering a loyalty program that sits on top of the game to, have to, to get people to come back more often, spend more time in the game. Uh, as well as also pricing optimization. So what's the right price, right time for different uh, customers. So enough about me, but maybe Fraser, you introduce yourself. Yeah, I'm, is this thing on? Yeah. So I'm Fraser. I, uh, I work for Scopely, business development. I spend my days uh, hunting down the best teams in the business to build enormous, durable franchises. Um, we've been doing that dependably for seven or so years. And yeah, that's, that's our mainstay. We're, we're effectively a publisher. Q. Hi, <laughs> my name is Q Lee. Uh, I'm the president of Gameville Come to Us USA. Uh, we've been doing mobile games uh, since 2000, so back from the feature phone days. Uh, I started out from Gameville. We ended up acquiring uh, Come to Us, uh, so we're running uh, two companies uh, now. Um, yeah, one of our uh, biggest hits uh, it, here in Europe is probably Summoner's War. Uh, sure. And uh, yeah, we've been. Uh, delivering products in the core uh, RPG area uh, for a very long time. <laughs> yeah, hi, everyone. My name is Vera Rapkina. Uh, I'm a product manager at Gizmod. Gizmod is the London-based uh, company uh, developer. We're doing music casual and hyper-casual gaming. We also do publishing of casual and hyper-casual gaming of different style, uh, um, focusing on a wide range of genres. <laughs> hi, everyone. Uh, this is Rika Vasani from IGG. IGG uh, is one of the largest uh, Asian gaming companies. We've been uh, in the field since 2006. And actually, we have two very, very big titles uh, that are called Castle Clays and Los Mobel that are really, really successful in the market. All right, first, because I, I kind of touched this already, but you know, since we got some people here with some very big titles and top ranks, but like, so how does a game stand out from the crowd, you know, as, you know, maybe any tips or suggestions as maybe you're launching a game, or as, you know, maybe we'll start with you, Enrique. Well, there are different uh, aspects, of course, when um, you want to pretend to have a big game like what we are trying to do, you need to uh, discover several things before, right? <laughs> Sometimes you fail before, you taste it, but when you... Um, check that you are succeeding with winning one of the games that you are having in the market. Uh, from our side, one of the most important points that we are focusing is our, in the community of our game. This is one of the real values that make our games really, really big. And that, of course, makes uh, our revenue for users really, really, really relevant on those ones. So on our side, what we want to focus a lot is in the community, and because they are the ones that make sustainable in the time these games that we're uh, having actually in the market. So the older one, it's Castle Clash, has been in the market since five years ago, and it's still a very, very important <coughs> game that generates more than 15 million on a monthly revenue. So it's uh, quite interesting in yeah. that type of... So it's more than just spending a lot of money on user acquisition. Yeah, of course. Okay. But, uh, right. Actually, we're not spending so much on, huh? on, on that game. It's just keep maintaining live ops, keep maintaining the, the, the community active, and, and of course, talking to them, understanding what the users want on that games, and trying to improve the game as the way that the users want. Okay, fair enough. Uh, for us, uh, Gizmos, we do uh, music casual gaming, and 
what we found out is uh, the best thing to do is to give users this additional feeling or additional skill. So uh, we have a large amount of games uh, which you can play piano tiles or you know, can drums or guitar. And what we found worked really well for us is when a user can not only play, but also get some skill. So kind of, uh, I think uh, in terms of standing out, it's either you find this unique idea, unique approach to a common theme, or you kind of find a way to not only entertain, but also teach, or maybe give you this uh, feeling of collaboration with a friend. So kind of uh, adding this additional layer in different ways. And I think um, it really works for us really well. And what we found out that uh, aside from gaming, we also have a number of utility apps, which kind of like BitMaker Go, which is our top title, which is a utility you can compose music with it. So what we try to do is we introduce this game mode to it, and we find out that people love uh, this when you, they play and then they compose music with it. And so I think uh, now with you know mobile market growing so rapidly and so many ideas pumping up, it's either you kind of in, go with it and invent something new, or kind of find a way to be at junction of a few genres and kind of oh I can do this and that together and merging them together and this is a way for you to create something unique and start your own type of genre. And okay. you know yeah. <laughs> what? And well, something that totally different in role playing games. Summoner's War has also been on the ranks for a long time. Any comments? So, um, you know, we've been running um, Summoner's War for the past five years, um, made more than a billion dollars in revenue. But um, one of the th key things, uh, when we look back at why Summoner's War uh, succeeded, I think it was because it was first of the kind, you know. And um, I think one of the, and then after we, we succeeded with Summoner's War, we tried to replicate it. You know, of course, we wanted another Summoner's War. And the, the following games all seemed to be too similar to Summoner's War at one point. And, um, and we noticed that the users don't go to the new game because there is already an existing game. You know? So I think being unique is very important. Uh, I know it's very hard to be unique, but uh, if you're not we're, we're learning that ourselves. We're, we can't even replicate the success again um, by doing the same thing. So, um, of course, if, we're, if you're starting a new company, uh, I would look at, and with a, such a saturated market like this, I would look at new categories. Our next best, best game is uh, actually MLB Nine Innings. It's a baseball mm -hmm. game. Nobody did baseball. <coughs> and so I think, um, you know, uh, the way... Uh, it's very hard for us uh, to 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 do it that way, but you know um, because you're taking a lot of risk when you're trying to do something new. But I think if you want a, a very decent success, I think um, that's the only way to go. Okay. Yeah. Well, you guys have had a scope had a wide range of <laughs> types of games. So anything different yeah. you want to add, or tips or tricks? Sure. I mean, we've, we've no one said just spend a lot of money in UA yet, but I'm <laughs> waiting. You know. Just spend a lot of money. No. <laughs> uh, I mean, yeah, we've we've launched six consecutive games in different genres, all of them top grossing. And I wish I could say that you know, I wish the advice to developers was just build an, an awesome game, just build a great game. But unfortunately, it's it's not just that anymore. You have to build an amazing game, and you have to build an amazing service, and you have to build an amazing brand with multi-year franchise potential, right? Those are things that most developers can't do on their own. Like, that's something that you need mm -hmm. to, to partner for. Um, I think that this whole idea of service games is really the thing that Scopely sees as, as the most fundamental part of our business. How do you define service games? Well. If you think about like when a when a player shows up on uh, PSN or Xbox, right? More often than not, they're showing up there with like thirty to sixty dollars, pounds, euros of purchasing intent, right? When somebody shows up on the App Store, they're there to snack. Mm -hmm. They're opportunistic. They want a bag of chips, <coughs> okay? And it's the publisher's job to turn that into something that's more long-lasting and durable. And that isn't because the game is great. That's because the service is great. And the service, I think, transcends all sorts of aspects that, that don't necessarily touch the product directly. It's all of the external marketing, all of the consumer-facing messaging, all the influencer stuff that you do, um, all the stuff that's actually in the game itself as well, of course. It's, it's, a, it's a very broad range of things. Yeah. When you're kind of touching to kind of the next sort of topic, how do you retain? So you know, it's challenging, it's difficult to 
choir players, you know, it can be potentially very expensive in terms of, you know, budget too, but, you know, now you've acquired a many, you know, other thoughts in terms of, you know, retention. How do you, how do you look at retention and keeping them to stick around a little bit longer? Maybe, Q? Um, <clears throat> I think uh, retention is is a value exchange. So, um, you know, you can't you can't have the users pay uh, for nothing. You know, like you have to keep on providing something new to the users, and that that's the only way they they will come back. That's the only way they that they will uh, pay pay to your uh, your service. You know, as as you mentioned, you know, I think. Uh, um, the product point of view really has to disappear. And I, when I look at a lot of uh, the games uh, serviced in this market, I think, no, um, I don't think there's a lot of companies that take service uh, as seriously as the top publishers do. And I think that's the reason why the top publishers are standing out because, you know, um, of course the users complain a lot that uh, we're not updating as frequently as possible, but, but at least we are uh, doing our best to uh, provide that. And, um, and that re requires a lot of manpower. And when you're doing service, and if you're, if you're just focusing on a certain region, you know, you can only make that section uh, happy. But um, as a publisher, we're also, we have more than 10 offices around the world. And that's because we want to provide the service as personable, personal as possible, as local as possible um, to them. Uh, we do, we do uh, not only updates, we, not only marketing, we also do uh, Twitch broadcasting. And on top of that, we, we started doing uh, city tours. Uh, so now we're doing face-to-face, -face, uh, right. we're building face-to-face yeah. -face relationships uh, with the customers. So I think um, services, there's so much depth in service. Uh, and uh, that's what I've, I'm still emphasizing uh, our team members uh, to be much more focused. Uh, that requires a lot of money, that requires a lot of uh, manpower uh, in order to do that. And I think that's how the existing publishers are trying to raise the bar so that the newcomers uh, can't compete with you. Anyone else anything to add on services or what you're doing in terms of retention? I just want to add a little bit about the retention thing. Uh, um, I agree that yeah, focus is important, and uh, sure, what works for us is like giving the user a reason to come back. Uh, talking about content, just adding new content, getting something else that why they would come back, and uh, what we wa look a lot when we want to have issues with retention and we want to boost it is activation. And I think, especially talking about you know simpler games like hyper casual games, which are that simple, making sure that amount of user pass through activation level, boosting activation level, kind of got how to play, got this first fun experience, this helps a lot with your retention. So uh, I think uh, the formula is like proper activation process, first session, and new content added, which together kind of gives you day one retention and like longer sessions and day seven, and seven day 30. Fraser, you had something you want to add, I think? Yeah, I mean, you this, that. sorry, yeah. yeah sorry. <laughs> no, it's good. Was, was it that clear? <laughs> uh, I mean, I think this is a huge topic for Scopely. Uh, I think the thing that we're focused the most on right now, and, and I agree with Q that this is a thing that um, all the top publishers are now really looking at, and it is a very deep rabbit hole to tumble down, but it is player-directed experiences. And for me, that's basically two things. Like, there's the, the sort of the very obvious kind of surface level stuff where it's having a very high level of feature interdependency and complexity. So the, the user can kind of set their own goals. They can choose different things to do. They're not funneled down, you know, too linear a path within the, the kind of tableau of experiences that you're offering, whether that's to do with, you know, social progress dimensions, where it's competitive or cooperative play, or churning through PvE content, or tinkering around in the meta component of the game. But then the other aspect of it, and this is where it gets really deep, is the sort of stuff that the user doesn't really see, but they feel it. So via cohorting users on a behavior basis, figuring out, okay, it makes more sense to show this number of ads or these types of ads to this player, or it makes sense to kind of push them towards this type of social interaction. Maybe they would be you know, well-placed in this guild, or perhaps we should surface this event more prominently to this group of players. These aren't choices that the player makes consciously, but it's a way in which the service reacts positively to their behavior via the data capture. Yeah. Player-controlled personalization. Like player-directed. 
fairly direct. Okay, good. <laughs> yeah. Someone should tweet yeah. that, please. Um, <laughs> do you anything to add, Enrique? You want? It's just uh, mentioned the same. It's uh, contact with the player, understand what the player wants. Mm -hmm. and, you know, with that is what we are trying to, to improve uh, the game as the way that they want. And this is what they make. Uh, better uh, relationship with with us, and of course, this is what we show to them how to how to engage more and more on the on the game. Okay. Anyone else add anything about player sure, journeys, if you will, or you know experiences? Or you can go on. But. What about um, anyone with an experience specifically doing, say, adding in a loyalty program in their own game or VIP, you know, type, you know, where you're segmenting different players and treating them differently? So, what we're trying, in order to contact them, we're doing something similar than you. We're starting since last year to get direct contact with them. Uh, we're organizing uh, local events in most of the markets where we, we started last year in Barcelona, doing some contact, understanding what they, what they want, bringing them into some social contest in order to try to create some engagement and bringing them some specifically loyalty programs to those users who are following us, not just on a customer service point of view, also on the social media side because we offer them different things that they can be able to, to get from those new channels that we're using actually. Yeah. Yeah. Q, you want to add anything? Yeah. Our, our events are open to anybody, but we actually did some digging into like profiling the people who had attended the event and how much they're spending. Like, but obviously, um, the top spenders all show up. You know? yeah. so, and when we, and that because we also have to justify the expense that um, that we're spending on all of these events. You know, is it worth doing this event? But um, I think. It, it was self-explained -exp by prof um, profiling those users, and, and when we looked at how much they spent, um, of course, we, we, we had an obligation to return to those users. Yeah. Well, certainly you guys have some games that generate some massive you know, revenues. What about other, like, uh, maybe in-game you know, VIP you know, programs, or se segmenting players down different type of, of funnels or anything? I don't maybe, you know, anyone have experience doing that? Uh, on our customer support, I think uh, we, we're trying to, uh, um, what do you call it, decrease the turnaround time uh, as, uh, as short as, make it as short as possible. We're trying to, we're, right now we're doing everything within the 24 hour window for our first response, but we still feel like it's, it's still very slow and I think um, we're, that's why, you know, like when we look at, when we look at forums, you know, forums mm -hmm. are so outdated, like when you compare it to like Reddit, and then when you look at Reddit and compare it to Discord, like Reddit's so outdated too. You know, so I think um, the users really want real time interaction with the, co the company. Um, that's why uh, we, we keep on, continue to do broadcasting on Twitch too, because it's more real time feedback from the users. Um, and I think that's why Amazon is winning everybody too. It's just the, the shorter time deliveries. So um, that's what we're focusing on, um, trying to um, provide the best amount of service uh, the, uh, to all of the users. But when that's not capable, um, uh, we try to segment the users and then try to provide customer support quicker for the higher, higher spenders. Uh, yeah. That's something that we're really looking at. What's the dollar amount for the VIP? Uh, okay. You're not sure. <laughs> but okay, yeah, kind of kid. So, uh, how about well, your game's a little more cat? Yours different. How's genre come into play in this, right? So, you know, very, your game's a musical apps, education apps, too, so slightly different level of spending than some of these people. Yeah, yeah, but yeah, it works different for us a little bit because, like, with casual gaming, and uh, music casual gaming, it kind of, people use it in a little bit different places even in hyper casual, than like regular hyper casual games, because you have to, you know, are you had headphones on or just to be in a quiet place, so it works differently for us, and that we don't do this really strict segmentation, but we kind of try to engage users more to share what they do, because, I mean, we have this really unique genre of music, and so at the, at the one hand, we have this really simple process of playing it, but on the other hand, we also let users to create their own tracks, uh, their own, and share it with us. 
So we kind of boost this and approve this kind of, and then shade on mm -hmm. social media. This worked really well for us, especially like you know when users said that they created a grand beat, which just your you know game, and you see how how it works, and then you publish it on social media, and other people, well, it's not just a game. I kind of I'm playing and I'm still expressing my creativity, not just like following a scenario. So this works, so it's not like segmentation by events, but it's more kind of boosting and encouraging people to do more with your app. And I think uh, it's like a little bit different approach and I see like it's more evolving. It's not like shaped, but I see more apps, uh, you know, following this path because I mean, I think segmentation is great. Segmentation by events, scenarios, this is awesome. But you know, with the, when you have like a simpler app, like hyper casual, so your scenario is more or less the same. So it's like kind of still, hard to know to segment it this way, but what you can do is doing profiling by, you know, a little bit different, by personas, this or, this or that way. So what we try to do is figuring out how much user wants to take from this creative process and then kind of boost and, you know, lean, lean him towards this or that direction. Okay. Related to segmentation and kind of funneling players, different like, what about getting kind of monetization, sort of, you know, ads versus IEPs in terms of you guys have or maybe some games, I don't know if you have ads in your games or not, but you know, if you have, you know, do you treat some players differently? Or is, I know I worked with one company once and they had a rule. It was, you know, it was a very IEP oriented game and it was after 21 days, if no one spent, we blast them with ads. <laughs> you know, but, so I don't know if you guys, any of you guys have any rules or tips or, you know, insights into anyone. Maybe Fraser, if you have any thoughts on that? Yeah, I mean, I think like, um, it's hard to come up with specific rules and tips because the level of segmentation, to go back to what you're saying, um, when you're dealing with the sorts of MEU that, that companies like Scopely and, and top publishers are dealing with, you're, you're segmenting across so many different groups and making so many different product choices um, with regards to you know, trying to, to manage that user journey and, and trying to you know, effectively create a durable business by not scaling the user away with types of monetization that they're clearly exhibiting negative behaviors towards. Um, so yeah, I, I don't think you know, I can come down hard on, on specific uh, you know, tips and tricks, like there are no silver bullets. Um, I think speaking more generally about how uh, ad versus IEP impacts monetization and impacts genre, um, you know, there's been so much talk over the last you know, six months or a year or two years even about hyper casual, and uh, I'm not coming down hard one way or the other on hyper casual. But one thing that I do see is that it's kind of an inevitability in a market of such obscene supply. I mean, literally like thousands of games being released every day. That there's going to be at some point this model that <laughs> leverages the top of funnel mechanics there, and obviously those are users that respond very well to ads and not very well to IEPs. Um, I think the challenge there, and, and I think it's a challenge felt across the industry, but it impacts hypercasual in particular, is that, you know, anecdotally, I've heard about CPI rates doubling every quarter, right? And so what happens to, like, market forces will continue to basically erode, like, the, the fully ad-supported game until, because the, the, the economics of it just don't work. You need to turn to other forms of monetization outside of ads in order to be able to have a, a sustainable business. Um, so yeah. Yeah, you have some thoughts, I think. Yeah, uh, yeah right. So it's like so it's from a genus and like we have smaller games. So <coughs> I say that it's usually a combination of both. But uh, what I mean as an advice, I think it's better to test because I agree it differs from genre to genre. But I mean, if it was a graph, I'd say like the simpler the game, the more chances that the ads would win, and the more complex the game, the more the chances are that <coughs> ad purchases would win. And this is what we see with our apps, uh, because, I mean, if we take like a really simple hyper-casual game, we're more leaning to, towards ads. And when it's more like kind of, for example, um, like Hello Piano we have, which is an educational uh, set of mini games. We teach you how to play piano, but we are different hyper-casual small mechanics and stats. And it's like really complex, huge app. So then for sure, it's like we go for subscription model because it's kind of intuitive. So I think that generally it would always be a combination. It's better to leave for the user what it would prefer. Uh, it would be like a, they would prefer to watch ads or go for an app. <coughs> but I think that there's definitely a dependency between how complex the game is and what you choose. And no, no wonder that with hyper casual we have so many like ad-funded games. Right. right. 
Well, all, yeah, so I mean, it, since you brought up hyper casual too, it, it's kind of obviously a huge hot trend you know, right now. It's uh, with coming, you know, Voodoo and Ketchup, Graham, you know, Quali all doing just massive downloads, you know, games and, you know, pumping out, you know, large arcade style games too. Any other, you know, thoughts on, because it's sort of just taken off in the last couple of years. Any other thoughts on hyper casual versus IEP in your games? I don't know. Ali or Enrique? So our games are more uh, guys know, yeah. deep, yeah. hardcore games, you know, mm -hmm. RPG games, so we're mostly focusing IEP instead yeah. of advertising, and this is a rule that we've been managing since the last uh, two games that we launched. But actually, there's, it's true that uh, in order to see uh, how we can increase a little bit the revenues on some games, we're starting to taste with some older games some different advertising formats in order to not damage the usability for the user. And also the other thing that we are starting to taste is the subscription model. This is something that I think that there's a lot of uh, path to move. Uh, and uh, we, we want to check a little bit more. I remember the older industry where we come from, right? And mm -hmm. the other services was really, really focused on that area and it was really successful on that side. And I think that there is a trend that uh, also the stores are starting to show us, right? So Google is off offering and, and the rest of the stores can offer these type of things. So it's something that we want to check. And we're looking at subscriptions or, you know, thoughts on that? Yeah. Um, yeah, as you mentioned, I think I think the platforms will solve that problem for us. You know, they're rolling out their virtual currencies. Mm -hmm. Once they roll out their virtual currencies, they can uh, make an exchange platform with ads on, on their own. So um, it, it'll be used like um, just okay. in-app purchases. So we don't have to integrate ads. <laughs> yeah. There we go. Yeah. I mean, Scopely certainly is very focused on IP monetization. It has been for a long time. We build big, complex games and they tend, you know, to your point previously as well, complex games tend not to, to monetize so well on the ad side and, and better on the on the IEP side. And yeah, we're we're exploring quite quite a lot in the, in other monetization models as well, um, including subscription. I think that you're right about the platforms, you know, wanting to basically own uh, how that kind of evolves. Um, in many ways, we're sort of like a little bit uh, at their mercy, but that's fine. <laughs> True. It's like. Going back to the older like, ones, the carriers used to take all, right? right Carrier, the yeah. Platforms, so. right, the they used to take up the to 50%. <laughs> <Yeah, laughs> yeah. like the battle days. <laughs> yeah, I like that, yeah. Well, what, so, um, I mean, what is the future of free-to-play monetization? So they're very focused on IEP. You know, is, is IEP here for the long, 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 long run? Or I, I don't think like, IEP is going anywhere for a long while. Um, I think that we're going to continue to see, you know, console and PC use mobile as their playbook for, for yep. how to, to expand into that area of monetization. I think the thing that everybody's talking about right now is the all-you-can-eat subscription model yep. um, and streaming games. I think it's interesting. People often conflate streaming technology with all-you-can-eat, which is a business model. And they're, because Netflix is a streaming service that has an all-you-can-eat consumption mo uh, business model, people frequently conflate the two, but streaming doesn't mandate that you must have an all-you-can-eat business model. And I think that particularly in the context, of, I think streaming is going to be important. The writing's mm -hmm. on the wall there. I mean, games are the last medium that doesn't yet have a dominant streaming paradigm um, and so I think it's pretty clear that from a technology point of view, there's an event horizon that we're careering towards. All you can eat, yes, perhaps on console, <laughs> on PC, on mobile. I just don't see how the economics of you know, a subscription fee that you get some percentage of based on player time can ever be attractive enough to publishers and developers no, um, no. against the, the current paradigm. And so I think for that reason, um, IEP is here to stay. And, and you know what? People like IEP because they spend a lot of money on it and the mm -hmm. market is the way consumers define it, not the way that, that platform vendors define it necessarily. Well, certainly if you look to music industry too, Spotify, so I don't think the you know, music owners, music makers are too excited about you know, that model. Yeah. And <laughs> right. I would say like we find like subscription model work really well for us because it's like a little bit different industry. Mm -hmm. But um, I think the interesting idea is that what we see from, you know, all these hyper casual trends, etc., is that like people don't really want to make choices. They just want to push one button and like don't care what they actually need. Do I need this or that? So I think with this trend kind of subscription model works really well because you just, you know, you just buy premium and you're with it and you get all you need for sure. 
And I think with this kind of, it's just a little bit different mentality. And I agree that it's not like 100% of people of this mentality, but it's like a little bit different approach. And you can see the same approach, you know, with Netflix, with, you know, Apple Music, when people don't really want to buy like one album, they just want to know that it'll be somewhere there. And when they come, they can just choose from a variety of options. And I think it's similar mentality, it's just a little bit shift in mentality. And I think at the end of the day, it'd be a, a choice as well, like you can buy, I app, or you can buy a you know, premium subscription. From what we see uh, from our experience at Gizmod is that, I mean, as long as uh, the type of your games like, is based, for example, on a content, so you can uh, provide new value every week or every day, which is better, so subscription model is really easy to adapt. But of course, I mean, I think another interesting thing is how like, different companies are now trying out like, how it's going to work. So, and to you know, provide constant value, they had to somehow change a little bit the gaming process. So I think we're in the shift and forming of a little bit different industry or genres or type the way you do the gaming to, you know, to adopt a subscription model. So some of those would go with that, others would stay the way they are because it, it's perfectly fine and it's been there for a pretty long time and I don't think yeah, there are <laughs> issues with that. It just, I think, of general is a good trend of having more choices and you know, suiting more mentalities and more types of users, getting back to this segmentation type of thing, and different people making different choices of what they want to pay and how they want to pay for it. All right. Well, I mean, obviously, Apple made some big announcements with Arcade, right? So in terms of having a subscription and premium, we kind of already touched on it. Do you want to say anything specifically about Apple Arcade or any predictions or you know thoughts on it? I can talk. This is being recorded, by the way. But go ahead. <laughs> hey, Apple. Uh, <laughs> I think it makes a ton of sense for premium product, which seems to be what they're targeting. Yeah. Um, and I can absolutely imagine, uh, as a gamer, being very interested in the types of premium products that show up on that service. As a developer, I'd feel tempted to kind of use it as my sort of repository for elder product. You know, like, why would you like forgo the, the day one price that you could get for your game that you've slaved over for a couple of years um, you know, in exchange for uh, a, a chunk of whatever the subscription price might be. Although I'm sure that you know, while, while the big vendors out there like Apple and, and other vendors are looking to populate these stores, the, there's gonna be some, some really nice opportunities available for developers there. Um, but how that, how that pans out long term, um, I wouldn't like to say. Okay. Any other thoughts? Thank you. Yeah, I think, I think it's going to be very successful, actually, Makes because sense. Uh, I'm a parent of three. So, uh -huh. so um, I know uh, my, I, I wouldn't want my kid to come up and say, like, can you do this in-app purchase for me all the time? You know, I'll just probably uh, subscribe. Like, to summoners to, war, no, no. <laughs> no. <laughs> I'll, I'll tell them to subscribe to an yeah. a, a Apple Arcade and then do whatever you want to, you know. And... Uh, that's the way I look at like Netflix too, you know, so it's very convenient as a parent, you know, so I think just for the hyper, it may, it may have a big impact on the hyper casual market, but mm -hmm. for the serious gamers, I don't think it will. Uh, well, yeah, I think so. You know, someone said yeah, for premium games, you know, it makes sense. And anyways, it's kind of nice to see there's might be something for those premium games too, because I, I know as a you know Nordic game, and it was there been a lot of indie people, and a lot of people are just kind of throwing their hand, you know, we talked earlier, how do you stand from the crowd, right? And lots of Indie developers, and we make you're just saying, I can't compete, right? You know, I just don't have the budget, so it's you know, so they're kind of moving towards premium because they think they have a nice little game, and maybe that presents an opportunity, you know, for them too. What about um, I think you know, I think Fraser, you already mentioned about streaming. You kind of sound, you sound like you're kind of bullish on the you know cloud gaming. So you know, the, maybe I misinterpreted that, but yeah, wait, I, wait, I mean, bullish on certainly for the industry as a whole. I don't yeah. know how that's going to pan out on mobile. Like, will players five years from now be playing, you know, the sort of full-bodied version of Call of Duty on their mobile that's identical in every way to the, to the home version? I really don't know. Yeah, well, that's what I'm, yeah curious, because there's, with Stadia and the announcement, right, in terms of, you know, it was, you know GDC, it was, you know, lots of stuff about the tech specs, you know, and I guess this Assassin's Creed, you know, in games, but not much in terms of games, not much in terms of, you know, pricing. So, you know, I'm just curious, maybe, if you have any insights or thoughts or predictions with that, with that, you know, cloud gaming announcements, or has it just been some big announcements and none of us really know what to expect? <laughs> and that's a fine answer, too. <laughs> I think on, on our side is as, as this type of um, RPG uh, gamers or uh, game producers, um, 
we're not really, really on that at this moment. Maybe later on, if we are going to launch different titles, different type of verticals, then we're going to be more on it. But actually, it's not affecting so much to us, and we consider that it's something that it's going to come, of course, but not for the actual games that we are having. Of course, uh, as a game developer, what we want actually is that the actual users keep spending this save of RPU that they are doing. So if we want to keep doing the same kind of revenues, they need to keep doing on in-app purchase instead of uh, any other kind of subscriptions. This kind of negotiation is going to be a little bit tough if we <laughs> start to talk to this with the stores and so on. So we will see. OK. Anyone else want anything to add about yeah. just Stadia, Stadia cloud yeah. gaming? I think um, it's it's great technology, but you know, when the clients are becoming so much better, you know, why would you put all of that load on the server? That would cost so much more. You know, I think convergence is already happening on the client side, and uh, so I don't know. It, well, the computing power is going to be cheaper over the time too, but but I think. That's just a lot of uh, a lot of costs that they might have to swallow in the early days, you know, and and eat into the advertising profit for yeah. Google. But, yeah. yeah. So, <laughs> well, uh, it might help their. Uh, I don't know who's going to pay for that, but right. <laughs> but but um, my thought is like, uh, I'm I'm still not. I I love the technology, but I'm still not sure if I would prefer to do it that way, you know. Yeah. What about any other, or do you have anything like that? Or we move on? Yeah. Loads and loads, but let's move on. You sure? Okay, <laughs> we'll save it for the end. Um, but, but any other mon just you know, monetization trends or just things interesting you saw maybe in the last year that well, we haven't mentioned you know, yet? Or, we know, need to be... Uh, Aware that there are, we need to be aware that there are different kind of platforms, at least for the mobile developers. Actually, mm -hmm. after what uh, happens with this uh, problem with Huawei and Google, for example, uh, I think developers must um, be realizing that there are some other ways that they need to arrive into the market. So, this kind of trend of potential alternative uh, stores or alternative things. Uh, in order to arrive to the user is something that uh, we need to think about, right? So Epic has been doing this from a while. We've been doing this in other markets, like in Chinese market. Mm -hmm. So it's these kind of trends that maybe we need to think about. And of course, we actually are super, super close to the stores because they help us a lot. But there will be different, different new actors in these uh, upcoming months, of course, or years. So we need to keep thinking on that. Okay. Well, I want to hear more about the months, but since you, you mentioned Epic, right? You know, and I think, uh, of course, it's fast. I mean, not you know, they have a massive opportunity, you know, too. But you know, are, are we going to see the end of the duopoly of Google Play on you know, app stores? Maybe you know, does anyone else want to? You know? I mean, I think any kind of store uh, diversification and, and you know increasing purchasing choice for consumers is a good thing, and I think probably all the vendors would agree with that. Despite the competition, you know, competition is healthy. Um, I'm not so sure about what Epic's plans are for mobile. Mm -hmm. um, obviously, there's the whole thing about uh, Fortnite circumnavigating uh, the Google Play Store. Mm -hmm. I'm not so sure how viable that will be for games that aren't Fortnite. Um, but, but let's wait and see. In general, I think uh, store diversification is a, is a good thing. Um, I, I don't know if it's going to have any impact on, on uh, Apple's business because there's just not really any way to maneuver around iOS. Um, but you know what? Consumers are very happy spending a lot of time and money there as it is. So, uh, yeah. Any other thoughts on that? Or, yeah, or? I, just, I just want to add, yeah, I agree. I think like Epic is more coming for Google than for Apple. Right. I think it's more uh, for Apple. Is, uh, I think they not changing their ecosystem to be that vulnerable, and that openness of Google system generally is kind of their vulnerability. And another trend I think with uh, besides uh, uh, Epic, I think is more social gaming, and we see Facebook instant being pretty successful, and Snapchat announcing that they would have, you know, their own gaming platform, and I think more coming. So uh, I think we, generally we can say that, yeah, it, it's not a duopoly anymore, but uh, I think it means different things for different monopolies at the moment. And I think like Apple will hold its position strong anyway, and all other will share the market in a certain way. Because uh, I mean, I think it's technical thing at one point, and I think it's like generally the approach, the mentality, every 
ever start at the moment showing. Yeah, but definitely I think like social gaming is a lot is a huge trend and we can see more coming and it's merging and like growing with every year. So I'd look at that as well. Yeah. Any other monetization trends just uh, that we're you know, we haven't mentioned just open ended? One, so one thing I saw was, you know, so I don't know, not a trend, not a platform trend. You guys, you know, we got some talking about some big ideas, but I thought it was just interesting, maybe call it a tactic, was um, so with the gold path, right? Clash of Clans, gold pass, right? And how they, you know, came out with some news, how they came out with this, you know, season pass. And that weren't the first one, obviously, you know, Fortnite had their battle pass on that too, but the idea of a season pass, and they charge five bucks a month. But what I thought was kind of crazy is that the game, Came out in 2012, and you know it's like a 150 percent increase in revenue, or 150 percent. It's just phenomenal increase. So, you know, are we going to start? Is that going to be a trend? So suddenly, every new game going to have some sort of season pass that allows people to, you know, accelerate the the goodies they get from when they're playing. I, I don't think we should um, view different monetization tools as sort of deterministic in terms of how they're applied throughout the whole market. They're, because it's a uh, an enormous market, and there's such a huge quantity of copying and pasting that goes on, which is, which is normal and healthy. Revisionism is, is what the games industry was built on. There is a tendency to think that the new thing is going to be the new thing for everyone, right? But I think there's a, you know, there is a future for the mobile market where there are games that rely heavily on ad monetization and not so much on IP. There are games that rely almost solely on IP. There are games that have uh, in, you know, and within IEP make very extensive use of, of loot boxes. And I think there are also going to be games that, that have, you know, a really, really good run at it with subscriptions and also with uh, kind of with battle pass systems as well. Um, and I think we're, we're going to see there probably is going to be some genre trends there a little bit. And or, or if not genre t trends, um, coming back to this previous point about the complexity of the game or the suitability of the game, um, I think socially competitive action games lend themselves very, very well to battle passes. Um, mm -hmm. I think that uh, games that perhaps are a little bit less frenetic in their pace maybe don't quite so much. Um, so yeah, it's, uh, I think it's kind of a horses for courses type deal. Horses for courses, yeah. okay. <laughs> Um, any other, right, are you guys looking at season pass or the kind of passes in your games at all right now? Anything? Well, I guess you just can't say. But. Any other thoughts? You kind of have more, so with this subscription model, it's easier. You can, different type of subscriptions, different type of users. Right. You kind of have special offers, all this type of thing. And it's, I mean, we have this forever in different type of gaming, but you know, with Apple providing more and more features, you can do it differently. So I think it's similar to the season pass because it's introductory prices, free trials, etc. And I mean, we see that this works really well for us and for, you know, a whole market. But I agree. I think it's like the market is growing so quickly at the moment. So it's uh, so that monetization patterns are shaping and still shaping. And I think it will take another year or two for it to settle down. And then it will be more cr so like like, you know, like two or three years ago, like crystal clear where you go with this scenario, that scenario. And at the moment, it's like everybody testing different combination of all scenarios possible. And, you know, uh, Google Play or Apple, like giving you more and more tools to do with that and kind of experimenting. So I think like at the moment, we're living in the era of experimenting more than kind of ready-made scenarios. And it's still like emerging markets and like hyper casual, we don't know whether we'll have it in five years, but we know that it's affecting the gaming at the moment, making it simpler, making even like mid-core going a little bit softer, etc. So it's just mm -hmm. like, I think it's a really interesting moment we are living in because it's like really new genres emerge on junction of different, different <coughs> genres and approaches. But I think it's at the moment, it's hard to tell what would win. But I think it's, like, it's a huge territory, so there is a place for different types and different combinations of monetization approaches and strategies. Yeah. Yeah. Um, I, I also think that um, subscriptions, I think, well, there's a lot of, there's a lot of benefits uh, to, like if back in the feature phone days, I think mm. um, we, we used to sell the games for $5.99 and you could subscribe at $2.99. The users would forget to, to cancel sorry, their I'm subscription sorry. and they average uh, six more months uh, yep. longer. So I remember those days. They, yeah, yeah. <laughs> they ended up paying twice uh, what the full price was. And, you know, and then like in certain countries like Korea, there were clampdowns from the government, uh, not allowing that, you know, because it's not a proper uh, value exchange with the users. So, 
but here, like I think, with as as we change as games as a service, I think now now we're seeing games that are serviced for four or five years now. So I think, uh, and if you look at a lot of PC online games, there's like games that have been serviced for 10 years plus, you know? And every year you subscribe, I think, the, it goes down to 20%, right? So, and I think uh, people, the developers will see more value coming from that. And then people, as they focus more on the service, I think uh, they're, they're probably gonna add more subscription uh, packages uh, to the existing games. Uh, uh, I think that's natural uh, evolution that's probably gonna happen. Right, and subscription literacy, talking about users also increases. So more people kind of know how it works, how to cancel it. Uh, I mean, what's the logic it? Because at the moment, I think it's like emerging. It's like a year and a half, maybe two years since it was launched. And like, it's still like not so many people kind of well aware how it works, what it is. And I think like once this year is over, like maybe another year, maybe less, you, uh, it, like people will be more illiterate. What it is, it, more kind of common thing like an app is, and it will be kind of easier to work with it and to adopt it as to your game. So, I mean, and in any way you, f you feel you can, right? It just, yeah, I think it's just, just the time of changes at the moment and like, it'll be fine, like more settled, like in a couple of years. From my side, it's gonna be uh, a mix between both things. So every game or some of the games like ours, we're, uh, we're gonna have different type of, of monetization models. So subscription packages as well as in app purchases increase on, on those packages. So I think a mixture, it's gonna be a model that it will fit perfectly for companies like us. Cool. Any, so I heard uh, any free to play sort of monetization tactics we wish would just go away? <laughs> yes, think about maybe think about in terms of players perspective, I don't know. You already touched on loot boxes, but maybe. Yeah, so for loot box, I think one of the interesting things that I saw uh, for China, um, like I think there was the traditional kacha um, mm -hmm. from from Japan, you know, where if there's like a hundred balls. You, yeah, it's kind of like gambling a little bit. You yeah. hundred times, every, you should be yep. able to pull out all hundred balls. I think now um, with the new regulation uh, from uh, China, I think for the loot boxes, I, I'm seeing, I think more more companies will move from from the percentage model to the one out of how many model. Okay. Uh, it's one of the changes that I think we'll see. Yeah, I generally find fascinating that like it's now gaming is treated more seriously, like and with you know more laws introduced. It means that I mean I think the industry at all is looking more tangibly. It's like a bigger. It has become a bigger player over the years. Because, and I think there'll be more legislation g coming forwards, and which is probably a good thing because it kind of makes it a safe environment, right? So I think this is also like we can put it as a trend. So because it means that penetration of gaming market is like bigger now than ever, and it's gonna continue, which kind of leads to creating new legislation. I think that um, anything from a monetization point of view that's too predatory ends up being its own undoing. Um, you can't uninvent the, the different types of, of monetization that have emerged, and why would you want to? I think the, the thing that you would want to do is to, is to apply them in a way that is sensitive and in a way that, is, um, that encourages you know, long-term patronage of your products. You know, like it's, uh, I think consumers are, are increasingly savvy. Um, they, they really understand the, 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 you know, the deal that they're getting into when they download a free-to-play game. And if you want to build long-term, durable franchises, you don't screw them over. <laughs> Makes sense. Well, I mean, that's also why I mean, kind of like the passes, right? Because it's kind of rewarding people for playing the game, right? You know, so, so, right. so it's, not, right. it's not trying to trick anyone. It's not any predatory sort of yeah. tactic, too. So. Um, I think you touched on a really interesting point to do with subscription services. And also, you've got subscription models and iApps. Um, realistically, all of these things are going to be um, wrestling for the, the player, the user's um, money at the end of the day. Do you think there is a space that exists for subscription services for free, free to place type games to exist inside that? Let's say it's the next big thing like Netflix. It, almost everyone has a Netflix account these days. Let's say everyone has Apple Arcade um, when, it, when it arrives. 
could a game like your own, most of your own, um, exist in that? Or would you, do you think you would make a version of your game that is a complete version of it without iApps, for example? Or do you think they can coexist? Why would someone spend iApp money in that service if they could, for example? So for anyone in particular? Or, yeah. okay. Do you have any for anyone in particular? Just anyone? Uh, no, okay. just open. I mean, never say never. Uh, this is a, a very dangerous business to get into the forecasting kind of stance on because uh, the arc of time has this horrible habit in the technology business of proving everybody wrong. Um, it wasn't so long ago everyone was saying that streaming would never work in, mobile, in, in any game's vertical, and now look at where we are right now. There's like insane investment happening from some of the biggest players in the market and new entrants as well. I think, um, personally speaking, I don't see a clear path to how you could either place a free-to-play game inside a, you know, an all-you-can-eat consumption paradigm as is, and I'm not clear on how easy it would be to retrofit the most complex and competitive free-to-play games in the market to, to such a model. Like, for a game that has so much dependent on the way in which the, the economy uh, interacts with, you know, very, very finely balanced, um, you know, like session time, sessions per day, all this kind of stuff. Um, I think it's really hard to imagine how you would retrofit uh, a f an existing complex free to game. What might happen is maybe there's a, a genre, you know, that, that emerges as a result of this new business model that is some kind of hybridized thing that we haven't thought of yet. But uh, I don't see a clear path, I'd say that much. Yeah, I'd say like, I think you can do that, uh, but again, I agree that more for a different genre, you have to think and be really clever with what you're doing. But the question is, why would you want to do that? Because it's really complicated, and it's really complicated for users to understand that, okay, I get that feature as an app, <coughs> or I get this as a subscription, and it's like really, really hard working process, th thought process because what you want for users is to be that simple. You say, this is the rules, and the rules should be like one-page rules, right? And it's like, okay, what should I do? So. I mean, I'd say like if you really want to do that, you can do that, but it's more kind of why take use on this really hard to decide process because you know when they hesitate, they just don't buy anything. So, and if you kind of design a game to be suitable for subscription, you probably just want to keep it this way because it's like you already just it's easier way to kind of promote one thing. On the other hand, if you have a genre which it's more intuitive with an apps, why would you want to kind of change it all, throw it away, and just put a subscription, I think it can be, it can kind of test one against the other, but it's like really, I don't think there's many reasons very generous when it would work naturally combined. All right, thank you.